When I was a child growing up in Alabama, I imagined all of it. I am living exactly what I dreamed about. The interesting, challenging part of it is how long it took. I don't know if you're ever really fully ready for fame. I think it happened when it happened because I was ready-ish. <laughs> to have the responsibility that I had because I was the first person in the position of having been on the cover of Time Magazine, in the position of being the first openly trans person nominated for an acting Emmy. If I say the wrong thing, it could affect my community negatively if I do the wrong thing. So it came with a huge responsibility and an understanding that the conversation with and about trans people needed to be changed in the media. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy from the back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> In this episode, I catch up with my good friend, Angelica Ross. She's won critical acclaim for her roles in Pose and American Horror Story. And it's the first ever trans actress to play Roxy Hart on Broadway. Exactly. <laughs> no, I can't go that high. <laughs> when I was on dating apps and single, all the men who would match with me and then be upset when they saw, and it's the first sentence in my profile. Right, right. I'm a proud no, transgender woman. They would, they woman. would read right past it. I went on they a date read. once they and read. told the man I was trans. I, he didn't know what trans meant. So we were in the car and he was like. I put transgender, because I don't assume. <laughs> Hi. My other guest, Cameron Esposito, is a queer, gender non-conforming veteran comedian who's unafraid to tackle taboo topics. She also stars in the ABC drama A Million Little Things. Getting to be sexy, getting to be like a sex object, getting to be in a romantic set of scenes, like that has been huge for me. And to also see a body that looked like mine because I do have breasts, but I'm mas masculine of center. There's a legible, I talk about being legible, right? <gasps> that like. I think you actually just like, changed my life in with that word. I'm so excited about the guests that we have on this episode. Really pioneers in representation of LGBTQ folks on screen and in the media. Wow. We are giving goddess energy. Yes, we are. Thank you, darling. Yes, thank you, sweet. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is going to be a moment. Yeah. Angelica Ross. Laverne Cox. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. I am so excited and honored and just emotional about getting this talk with you today. I just haven't seen you in a while, so I, I miss know, you. We've both been so busy, so yes. it, it took this moment for us to be able to have a good, you know, good, 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 good Judy conversation. And I wanted to be like, re I wanted to be us, you yes, know? I mean, and we're so talking honestly, right? A kiki. Yeah, it's, let's have a kiki. <laughs> in 2019, you and I went viral, um, hanging outside of it a It seems club. like it keeps going viral. Thoughts on Little Nas X coming out. We love him. I don't know if he officially came out. Did he? Yeah, I think he, he did. Just, I think it's amazing in hip hop that we're having this moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think more guys who are gay in hip hop should come out. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I miss most yeah. is those times. Yeah. We were just, you called me up, you were like, girl, I'm getting a car. You know, let's go have a night on the town. You know, and we just had a night on the town. We, had, you know, had a drink or two. It was just a moment. And I just didn't expect you to also kind of fall into the moment as much, you know, because when you were like, girl, I was just like... It was so weird. You know, it was like you gave a prophecy. It was like, I hope more men who gay are gay in a hip-hop come, come out. <laughs> come out. <laughs> and I With a little fell bit out. of... <laughs> Bitch, I have fell out. It's so wild that, like, in 2019, that that was, like... I mean, it's a kiki and it's a cackle, and we know... Because we know. Because we know. Underneath the, the truth of it all. And we know some of the celebrities. <laughs> but I do want to start with acknowledging and celebrating your Broadway debut. You are currently preparing to be Roxy Hart in Chicago yeah. on Broadway. You studied musical theater as a child, did musicals as a child. That was a dream of yours that I know you said that you thought would be deferred because you were trans. Absolutely. And now you're about to make your Broadway debut. Are you able to process this dream being realized? I, I, I feel like I'm still processing it every day. Yeah. It has been so hard to break through, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, to not be just lumped into the very obvious tokenization that comes from the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. 
but to still have to prove and show folks that, no, I'm here because I deserve to be here, because I deserve to take space, because I'm talented. And to be confident in that. I grew up playing piano, singing in gospel choirs, doing all this stuff, and then I transitioned. And I didn't know how to vocally transition. Mm. Um, I can relate. You know, I'm my, a big, I have, my voice is way deeper than yours. Yeah, girl. <laughs> so it was like, and now I sing soprano, though. So yes, yes. Anything's possible. Well, well, anything's <laughs> possible with vocal training. Yes. And so I just wish that someone would have told me sooner yeah. or that I just would have realized sooner that all of this was possible because what I've been able to accomplish in the short amount of time that I started believing myself, releasing my first debut single, Only You, yeah. performing at like the Soho House and Outfest and at Pride. You know, I'm just really excited about this next chapter for me musically mm. yeah. because I've learned to use my voice. It's like I found my voice all over again. Mm. And it's just singing becomes a lot less of a of a task and it's just so effortless and it's just, I'm just so excited. Sure. I've always written music, but I haven't always had the confidence in my own songwriting, mm -hmm. but now I'm getting more and more confident. And as long as it feels true, then that's really all that matters. Cause when people hear it, they want to feel something that feels true. Yes. So I say, I know you're studying with a wonderful acting teacher named Brad Calcaterra, and a lot of what Brad did for me was allowing me to tap into the kid that liked to play. That kid who didn't have a censor, that kid who didn't like have people calling me the F word and calling me a sissy and saying, you know, don't hold your wrist that way. And that kid who was just free. Yeah. And yeah. that level of freedom is what I need as an artist. And what I love about being an artist is in particularly playing characters who are deeply flawed I in ways that I, I feel like I necessarily can't be as Laverne Cox the, yes. you know, we get to be navigating messy respectability, <laughs> you know. I could get to yes. be messy through the characters, yes, and it yes. is the best, best gift ever. I mean, Candy, I got to be, listen, Candy said a lot of things that Angelica might not, well, I do go there. Yeah, I'm like, I, really, I, I girl? I do go there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I go there a lot. But, you know, I really got to pay homage to the girls with candy. Shut mom, girl. Enough of your lip, Electra. It's hammer time, bitch. The girls have hammers. The girls yes. have had hammers in their bags. But for you know a what? It, it shows to the fact that sometimes we have to grab whatever we can. Yes. To protect ourselves. Yes. At first, I had mixed feelings about the hammer becoming oh, yeah. a whole thing. I was glad that everyone could laugh along with the situation, but I wasn't sure that everyone would understand the context, mm -hmm. what's underneath that, why a girl like Candy would be carrying a hammer in the first place. Yeah. It's not just because she's some wild character, but it's because girls like us sometimes need to grab what we can to be able to protect ourselves. Absolutely. So, um, but I realized that it became a conversation piece and an opportunity to always talk about yeah. that. So I appreciated that. You really just have to unmatch and delete and move on. Yes, unmatch, <laughs> delete, move on. Thank you, girl. Ooh. I'm somebody, somebody.
it's like, what does that look like? What does that self-love look? Because we hear RuPaul say it all the time. How are you gonna love somebody if you don't love yourself? But what does it look like in practice? It looks like saying no sometimes to things that don't value you. Absolutely. And and for the trans girls out there, knowing that we have value, that, that, that we are anointed, and that we don't have to settle for crumbs. So we don't have to Absolutely. take crumbs and make a six course meal. We don't have to do I used that. to do that. Girl, we all did. I used to do that, and that is just a beautiful thing to be reminded of. Just a few years ago, it was in 2020 when I was um, here in LA, and I was, a friend of, was like, let's go take a walk in Griffith Park. And like, all of a sudden, like, this dude is asking the time, then he asks if I'm a man or a woman. My friend says, F you. And he had one of those folding chairs, and he goes after my friend. And then my friend, whew, yes, it's triggering. Um, my friend's instinct was to get between me and the person um, so that the guy wouldn't come after me. And then, like, they, like, he hits the dude, and then the and then it, like, really is over as fast as it started, and the guy, like, kind of runs off. And it's just like, and that could have been so much more. What I believe was going on in the moment, I'm like, why is, why is he all up? And he was looking, I had leggings on, he was checking things out, wasn't sure if it was okay for him to be attracted to me, in his mind. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he needed to confirm guy or girl. Like when I was on dating apps and single, like the, all the men who would match with me and then be upset when they saw, and it's the first sentence of my profile. Right, right. I'm a proud no, trans woman. They would read right past it. I went on they a date read. once they and told read. the man I was trans. I, he didn't know what trans meant. So we're in the car and he was like. I put transgender, because I don't assume. <laughs> and it's not just me, other trans women whose profiles get flagged when men match with them. And we see that guys don't read profiles. And they get upset that they've matched with us instead of just being like, oh, I'm not interested, unmatch. They flag our profiles and then so many men flag our profiles and our accounts are deleted and they're like, you're doing something crazy. And it's just, no, I'm just being I trans and I'm dating I had a man out. threaten to shoot me. Oh my God. Like he threatened to shoot me like from LA to San Francisco. Because he matched with you on a dating app? Yeah. And because I called him out for being ignorant. You really just have to unmatch and delete and move on. Yes, unmatch, <laughs> delete, move on. What yes. I feel like it's so important to say is that there is a narrative, and this is the narrative that they've created, right? That people who, you know, that trans women are trying to force straight men to date them. Like, when have we ever had to force Girl, a man? First of all, there are girls who are getting over right now who got their houses paid for and cars paid for because they know when to shut up. It always baffles me when I see sex workers like exposing celebrities. I'm like, the girls who make the coins keep their mouth shut. Absolutely. Like, those are, That's you know. whole life 101. Girl. They say that trans women are tricking these guys or whatever. No, no, no. These guys are tricking you. Damn. They're not telling you the truth. And the reason why they're not telling you the truth is because they are fully aware of the box that you want them in that you want to put their masculinity in. Because there are so many people who will be like, well, just say that you're gay. You like trans women, just say that you're gay. It's, and it's not that. They're not. I really believe, based on what I'm hearing from um, what is going on with these men, <laughs> Spill the based tea. on what I'm hearing, they, a lot of them are just freaks. And they like yes. a lot of things. Yes, yes, yes. And they wa they just want to do a lot of different things. And I think a lot of times with sex workers, it's a really about the, you know, you're paying for the experience. The experience and the anonymity. And, yes, yes. and for you to keep your mouth shut. Absolutely. And so I think that, like, it's deeply problematic when, like, people hear that a famous man is with a trans woman and they um, automatically think he's, say he's gay. Because then that is disavowing the womanhood of trans women. Absolutely. And it is also, like, not acknowledging that sexuality exists on a spectrum and that people... He, you can be into a trans woman and just be completely straight. You can be pansexual. You can be bisexual. You can... There's so many different things and it should all be okay. It should all be the okay. stigma, it's like, it's, I, it's so exhausting. I can't believe in 2022 we're still dealing with stigma and that there are so many men, celebrity men, famous men, who are terrified of people finding out that they're sleeping with trans women. I can't even, I honestly can't believe it. I really can't. I'm happy for my girls who are making their coin, though. Good girl. Let me tell you, I, 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 cons up. I consider going back on the whole block. <laughs> I'm I still do. considering 
going back on a whole block. I joked about what would my Eros profile be? The first trans woman on the cover of Time magazine to be nominated for an Emmy. Girlfriend experience. <laughs> Let me say, girlfriend experience, $5,000 an hour. Ah, uh, what would it be? Could you imagine? Like, God forbid I have to go, you know. Listen, I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Womanhood is like really complicated. It's not just about, you know, sort of chromosomes and reproductive organs. Womanhood is an experience. People who, who are biological essentialists, really, totally discount like people's experience and how gender is policed. Telling women they're not woman enough if they don't do blah, blah, blah. Telling men they're not man enough if they don't do blah, blah, blah. And then reinforcing that with violence. If gender was so innate, right? If it was so just about chromosomes and genitalia, why do we have to police them so much? You know, like sometimes I feel like a woman, sometimes I feel like a cartoon fox. And I know it's not confusing. You know what I mean? You can see what I'm saying. I am imagining like, the right wing media ecosystem like clipping that and yes, just running with it. Absolutely. A lot of us started out. I remember, girl, I remember like Trans 100. Yeah. You know, and we all come from this like grassroots kind of organization space. And there's so many of us that if we look back now 10 years, so many of us have been there this whole time doing this work. Yeah. And now so many of us are in our own lane of success. And I feel, I don't know, but I feel like it feels like we're letting the community down because we're allowing the industry to put one of us in each corner. And sometimes it's very easy because we need to work. So we, it's easy to keep us apart mm -hmm. and keep us busy. But if we don't recognize that that is the oldest trick in the book of white supremacy is to s divide and conquer, mm -hmm. So we have to find ways to come together and build power together because I think we're stronger together than we are as individual stars. I have been reflecting on what, you know, really, what would that look like? Why don't I, why haven't I had that vision, right? I haven't thought of the, the collective in that, in the way that you're talking about and why don't I have that vision? And I think a lot of it is still, I'm still in survival mode. As, as successful as I seem on the outside, there is a part of me that's like, girl, you're lucky to, you're lucky to be here. They will take this away from you in a second. If they try blacklist Janet Jackson or the kit back in the day, they can do it to you. That, that narrative plays for me. But let me tell you something, Laverne. Yes. I'm looking at you right yes. now. Yes. Ain't nothing about you they can take away. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, even though people say you're too radical, me, I'm too radical for certain spaces. I don't get all the bookings I probably could get. I'm not associated with all the brands and companies I could be associated with because of my mouth. But what I know is can't nobody pay me for that. Not, and not unless it's scripted. Do you understand what I'm saying? Scripted. So, but my essence of who I am and bringing my word and bringing my power to places, can't nobody take that from you, Laverne. Thank you. You're um, Laverne mother Cox. Indeed I am. <laughs> and I still, and I, you know, but I'm, I have my insecurities and I feel like I understand how the system works and how there's just, 
I feel like there are people waiting for me to mess up. And, and yeah. so I can like yeah. be taken down and it's bigger than me. Mm -hmm. It is my whole community that could be affected if I say or do the wrong thing because I'm the first trans person to do this and this and this and this. And yes, that's way too much pressure to put on oneself, but like, but Angelica, is that not the truth? Are there not people out there waiting for for me for us to like do or say something and make it an indictment of our entire community? And no, that's no how one's you gonna know, be perfect. No but, one's gonna be perfect. But that's I've how not you been know perfect. that they're not allies to begin with. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Angelica Thank you Ross. for sharing your spotlight, Miss Ross, Miss Laverne Cox. This good lighting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm really trying to have fun with the glam part of it. Like, yeah. it, sometimes it gets, like, burdensome with all the fittings. And trying to squeeze in the clothes can just be a whole thing. Um, I, I hear you. <laughs> I mean, I'm wearing a T-shirt. So, you know, we're having slightly different experiences of today. <laughs> Cameron Esposito, welcome. How are you feeling today? Well, Laverne, first of all, I'm thrilled to hang out with you. Second of all, I'm realizing I no longer remember how to sit in a chair. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> We're just like, I, I keep thinking, how does my body go? Does it, how do I, do I look like I know how to sit in a chair? You do, you look okay. very relaxed, you look very at ease. Now, why are you questioning the act of sitting right now? What is going on? You know, I'm aware that there's a camera. Yes. And I am very aware of my bod and how I'm gonna be perceived and I'm mm. trying to understand how to stay like present with you because you're somebody I respect and I yeah. want to have a conversation but then I also want to make sure that whoever's watching at home gets the right impression you know what I'm saying wow. and it's a lot to manage yes that sounds very like you're self-conscious is that accurate would that be an accurate Girl, yes phrase? okay <laughs> so yes. I certainly have that and I had it a lot more when I'm younger. I'm 50 years old now. And um, I, did a, I did a student film many years ago, um, an NYU student film, and I had to play Marsha P. Johnson, which was an incredible honor. And Marsha's look was very different than the high femme, you know, cis assuming thing I was going for in 2004 that I'm probably still going for. And so we had a makeup artist and I didn't look at myself. I didn't, I didn't look in the mirror. I had no idea how I looked until I saw the film. Wow. And and what I learned from that is that if I'm thinking about how I look, I'm not present, mm -hmm. I can't be in the work, and I have to let that go. And even though I'm like glammed and beat for the gods and you know, all the things that are going on here. Yes, by the way, an excellent track of yours. Just <laughs> wanted to say. Oh my God, you know my song. Yeah. Beat for the gods, dusted and carved. It's fitting. Before the God. I can't, I got it I in person? I got it in yeah. person? Okay, yes. please. Um, I have, I have a team for that. So I have great folks off camera who are thinking about that so I can be present. The, the time in my life that I am the most connected to reality is when I'm on stage. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm on stage doing stand-up, I feel so dropped in and I feel so unselfconscious and I feel so connected to other people and what I'm working on in my personal life is trying to ever feel that way in a different environment, but it's hard, you know? The straight, cis, white dudes I'm friends with who have, they've got every category of privilege that know me are not confused by what we're talking about. You said there's a point in your life where you would talk about things on stage that you couldn't talk about one-on-one. -on -one. Is that because of it? Do you know what it is about the stage that takes away that self-consciousness for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's the safety of the anonymity of telling a bunch of, it's like a bunch of strangers, I'm never gonna see them again. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna ask me follow-up questions. Literally, I can have them kicked out if they do. Um, I'm okay. very in control. And, mm. you know, I think I had a very tough, I had a tough coming out experience. I felt um, very shamed as a kid about my body and my gender. And so I think when I found stand-up, it was an opportunity to tell a bunch of people in a way um, that I felt safe who I am. I leaned in and I kissed her. And your gasps are not out of place. <laughs> it was incredible. This kiss, it was like, um, it was like the guy in Memento realizing what his tattoos meant. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
plus Edward Norton being like, Brad Pitt's not real? Plus Bruce Willis being like, I'm dead? It was like all of those. I was gonna start our conversation talking about your pronouns, because I had a moment when I found out you use they pronouns, and I was like, but they're also identify as a lesbian, but how does, if they're non-binary, how are they also lesbian? But then, then they would say, well, you're, they're also identify as gender fluid. I was like, oh, okay, so they're fluid. So one day it's this and one day it's that. So that makes sense. But yeah. for a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. that might not, they might not get that totally. you use lesbian, you use gay, you use gender fluid, you use yeah. they, them pronouns, you use she pronouns. Totally. So for some people that is confusing, but, I, Gender, can, can, it, can it just be fluid? Can't we just like? That is my experience. I mean, sometimes I f truly, fully feel like a dude. Like sometimes I feel like a woman. Sometimes I feel like a cartoon fox. And I know it's not confusing. You know what I mean? You can see what I'm saying. I am imagining like, the right wing uh, media ecosystem like clipping that and yes, just running with it. Absolutely. But like I use she. Who cares? Yeah, who cares? Mm -hmm. I use she and they and I, um, and I know that like some people don't get this question at all, but I get it all the time because I look a little pronouncy. Like this is some of the stuff that I'm saying. <laughs> like I just, the other thing I will say is that the people that know me, they don't seem confused by yes. this. My yes. friends, mm -hmm. the straight cis white dudes I'm friends with who have, they've got every category of privilege that know me are not confused by what we're talking about. Yeah. So sometimes I also think that it's, it's like a limitation based on experience, right? And there are a lot of people who have to stay closeted about different aspects of who they are because of where they live, because of what their job is, because of what their family situation is. But like, I don't have to be. And I will say that like, while I might be confusing to folks in airports, I'm not confusing to my friends. I'm not confusing to you. You no. know, we're sitting across from each other. You get it. Yeah. Like you see what's going on with me. It's not confusing. Same thing. You're not confusing to me. I get what's going on with you. Like I, I get it. Like we're, you know, encountering yeah. each other. And I think that's really beautiful. That yeah. is why it matters to me that I got to do this, you know, silly Hollywood job that, yeah. you know, like I never meant to do, but but got to do, is because um, I think more people will meet me. You, you've talked over the years about having a tricky relationship to your body. Yes. You've had, talked about having disordered eating, um, wearing baggy clothes for a while. I yeah. think you developed early and just, and didn't like your breast. Yeah. Where are you at age 40 now with your body? I'm like closer than I've ever been to, okay. to love. Right now, I'm on a, I'm on a network drama. A million little things. A million little things. I have to take my sh shirt off on camera, which I've, I've never taken my shirt off on camera before. And then also my character is pursued by another character played by Grace Park. And Grace is somebody who's been like, you know, on network television for a, a long time playing like characters that are, you know, she's like the star of Hawaii Five-0. It's just like, a genuinely certified hot person. And I think for me, it like really meant a lot to me. I didn't know how much it would mean to me to do those scenes, but then like see them. Mm. Oh, that's done so well last a week. You owe it to yourself to see if this whole thing is just a phase. Well, too bad for them, but this is not just a phase. I want it. Getting to be sexy, getting to be like a sex object, getting to be in a romantic set of scenes, like, and and arcs, you know, that that has been huge for me. And to also see a body that looked like mine, because I I do have breasts, but I'm mas masculine of center. I I don't even feel like it, I've seen a lot of bodies that look like mine on television. Certainly not like a network television. Um, but I it is still challenging, and I think part of the reason is that like. I don't, for me today, and this you know could change, I don't think there's something I'm gonna do to change my body. Like I don't think I'm gonna surgically alter my breasts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you don't think you have dysphoria? It is a dysphoric thing, but I think some of that dysphoria is not like me alone in a room looking in a mirror. I think mm -hmm. some of it is me looking at culture. You know, when when there is a non-binary, gender non-conforming character, that person is usually like so, so, so thin yes. or flat chested. So like when, when I first watched the L word, I was like, amazing, like Shane, like I'm a Shane, I'm clearly a Shane. But then, you know, Kate Menig would take her shirt off and it's like, well, but that person doesn't wear a bra and like, you know, I have D cup breasts. Like I like to wear makeup, mm -hmm. you know, even bef to get like some makeup done for this today. Sometimes folks will be really gentle and ask like, so do you just want like, 
you know, essentially men's grooming. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, like, I'm like Bowie. Like, I'm, I like glam, yeah. you know, but it's a, it's, a rep it's a presentation that feels very me mm -hmm. that I s didn't see a lot. Yeah. So I think it was hard for me to feel comfortable. And I think I felt very patrolled. You know, people would make a lot of comments on my body. People still do. Thank you for that word. That is exactly what I have been trying to describe. Language is also for... a place of struggle. When you have the language, ah. it kind of can be so illuminating. But tell me more. I talk about being legible, right? That like. <gasps> oh my that, God! That, yes. Like, Thank you for. That. Sorry. My brother and I talk about that a lot because my brother is Negro Gothic and punk rock, and he's black and goth. And there's certainly lots of black people who are goth, but because he wears eye makeup and has long hair, like for a long time, people were like, "Are you trans?" And people were calling him for trans shows. He was like, "I'm not trans. I'm not. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a dude. I, I'm a dude. I like being a dude. I just yeah. I'm goth. I'm punk rock. And when you're white and wear and you're goth and wear eyeliner, people don't necessarily assume you're trans. But when you're black, it's like this whole there's totally. not the race thing become the race in the context of goth makes yes. you illegible. And your gender expression for uh, for you um, because you don't haven't seen it and, and potentially for other folks become is not legible within a context. So the, the people need a reference, right? I think when uh, being a black woman with blonde hair and we have Beyonce and Mary J. Blige and Tyra Banks, and so they're, you, you're all of a sudden legible, right? Oh, you you look like this and you're giving this, even though I look nothing like those and stunningly beautiful women. Um, it's about illegibility, right? And when you perform gender in a binary way um, with some level of success, or even like failing, there's a legibility in the failing within wow. the binary, right? But when you are non-binary or gender yeah. fluid, the legibility thing is really, it, you're not necessarily legible within a structure within patriarchy. And I also wanted to talk to talk about that because you talked about when you came out as a lesbian and made that decision that you were you were opting out of the patriarchal gaze. And so that also feels like it's tied to all of this. Yes. First of all, I mean, I think you actually just like changed my life in with that word. Thank you for that word. That is exactly what I have been trying to describe. Language is also for... a place of struggle. When you have the language, ah. it kind of can be so illuminating, but tell me more. No, just that like, yes, I feel like never in my life have people known how to take me. I still feel that that is true today. Mm -hmm. I, ju I just, I find that the response seems to be confusion. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the confusion is rude, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just like somebody genuinely does not know what's going on. And all of that is hard to navigate. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be cruel for it to be exhausting, you know, to just be like, oh my God, what, how much more explaining do I have to do, mm -hmm. you know? and. And now I feel like what's so amazing is that, you know, I'm in a relationship with somebody who loves me for who I am. I'm, I'm, I get to have a job where I get to be myself. That's so not true for so many people. Absolutely. What an incredible position of privilege. Yes. I get to show up and people are like, what would you like to wear at this point? That's, that is bonkers to me that that is true, mm. you know, and, and um, that I get paid like to have this hair. I mean, it's just like not stuff that some people get to yeah. have, but it still is a burden to just be outside of legibility to just to just be a source of confusion but also a person some of us are just hardwired in certain ways some of us are introverts some of us are extroverts some of us are straight some of us are are queer some of us are cisgender some of us are trans if we are not living in the truth of that who we are that is not sustainable. Living a lie is not sustainable. And for me, 25, um, 25 years ago or so, I was wearing makeup and women's clothes every day, but I had not medically transitioned. So I was in a very kind of gender non-conforming space. And going out on the street, riding the subway, walking into a delicatessen as a gender non-conforming person is hell. It is hell on earth. Gender nonconformity was like my compromise because I had internalized so much transphobia that I couldn't accept that I was a woman. And a lot of the ways in which I had imagined 
trans women being didn't comport with like the feminist politic that I had, didn't comport with like the strong woman that I saw in my mother and the women that I admired. And then I met these very elegant, smart, awesome trans women and I was like, oh my God, this is me and this can be me and I can be a trans woman and not be a bimbo and not be, I don't know, like I don't know what, I just had all these sort of misconceptions about who trans women and trans people were and it was an ownership that felt so empowering of like, I am a transgender woman that is what's been going on with me. And it was just like having a name for it too was just like, <sighs> it was just such a relief more than anything. Um, that didn't necessarily make my life easier in terms of the world, but in terms of my relationship to myself, absolutely. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. That person has maybe received less feedback in their life than like you and I have received. Mm. I have received a lot of feedback. Oh, I've received a lot of <laughs> feedback. One of the things, um, I think you said on a podcast that one can joke about anything. Yes. Um, and I, I'm, I was just, I would love to parse that out with you because we're in a moment with comics where a lot of comics are very frustrated with what they're calling <laughs> yes. wokeness. And you can't say anything anymore. And people don't have a sense of humor, especially those trans people. And I think I'm hilarious. Uh <laughs> you are. Yeah, absolutely. And so there is a lot of conversation now about what can, what can be said, what can't be said. And then the harm. And I've always, you know, thought free speech has consequences. And when you joke about marginalized people, people who already have high suicide rates, high murder rates, who are deeply discriminated against. I'm, I'm talking about trans people right now. That the consequences often are for people who are already the most marginalized. So for you as a comic who feels that we can joke about anything, how do you land, and as a, and as a queer person, how do you land with like comedians who want to say, things that a lot of folks, a lot of trans folks specifically, it just seems like it's trans stuff right now that people are having it is. issues with. What's your take on that as a comedian who yeah. believes you should be able to joke about anything? I do believe you should be able to joke about anything. So to me, what it sounds like when I hear comics talk about um, feedback as if it is censorship, those are things that are not the same. To me, what it sounds feedback like- Feedback is not censorship. Feedback is not censorship. Feedback is not censorship. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I like. To me, it sounds yeah. like, first of all, that that person has maybe received less feedback in their life than like you and I have received. Because mm. I have received a lot of feedback. Oh, I've received a lot of feedback. <laughs> like People, a lot. There's feedback yes. coming right now. If I open my phone, I there is a plethora yes. of feedback. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> the idea that somebody would have something negative to say about my stand up, I have never done stand up without that. Like, the moment I took a microphone and walked on stage, people gave me feedback. I am sure that is also true for you in your career. So the so whenever I've gotten feedback walking out the door, like, I, I, too, I get feedback walking I got, out the door. I, I can't walk the out the door. Yeah, I yeah. got feedback from my parents yeah. when I was a kid growing up. Yes. So the idea <laughs> that this person is first of all throwing a fit, I want to be like, wow, what a life you have had. That this is a new experience for you to receive feedback. The other thing that I think is interesting about this fit that people are throwing is um, the idea that like you and I don't get even more heat from the queer community, the trans community. Like as a gender non-conforming person, gender fluid person, when I get up on stage, I am representing a community. So it's not that just that I've heard feedback from other people, I've heard a ton of feedback from our own community. I mean, is this your experience as well? Oh my God, yeah. And it's been the most painful, hurtful, difficult when my community is disappointed when they are, and that they've, that's happened far too many times and it's devastating. And it and it's like, I haven't done, especially because for years, there's more trans representation now, but for many years it was very little. And yeah. so there was like, if I do do something wrong or say something wrong, it affects an entire community. Yep. And that's like huge. 
uh, responsibility. And so it's devastating when my own community is disappointed. And then look at the grace. Look at what you've had to do. You know, you've had to be who you are and be a part of this marginalized community and then receive that feedback and keep your head up and endeavor to improve and go on. So I guess I just, honestly, I hear those comics. I just think you sound like a big baby. Like that's what you sound like to me. You do not sound like somebody who should be doing the same job that I'm doing. Like, I think it just sounds like I might be better at my job than you mm. or that you might be better at your job than them. I am, this was so wonderful and I, feel like I want to check in with you in like a year, six months to a year, and see where all of this is, all the things that we've talked about. That sounds great. Okay, fine. We'll just turn this into an actual friendship. You've got it. <laughs> I want to shout out everyone who has the audacity to follow their dreams. It is really scary to take a chance, to take a risk and follow your dreams, particularly if you're an artist, particularly if you are a person who desires to sing or act or model. And these businesses are really hard to get into. And the proliferation of trans folks making music and being signed to labels and on television, writing, directing, all doing all the things. It is so beautiful and awesome, and I am so inspired by you. I really am inspired by everybody going out there and having the courage to live their dreams and to be visible. Visibility is not revolution in and of itself. It needs to be accompanied by social change, by systemic change, but visibility matters and representation matters and your story matters. And creating spaces so that you can tell your story, if you're not seeing it out there, we need it. It can change the world. Your story can change the world. And by, by that, it might not change all the systems, but if you can touch one person, if you can inspire one person to believe and understand that they are worthy, that they are enough, that they have a right to exist in the world, that is life-changing.